This is Look West, a podcast from California's Assembly Democrats. Happy Pride! Happy Pride! Every June, California celebrates Pride Month, a time for us to reflect on the incredible accomplishments, hardships, and journey of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities. Hi, I'm Emily Weber, and this is Look West. Joining us today to discuss the importance of this month and the actions California is taking for the LGBTQ plus community is Vice Chair of the LGBTQ Caucus, Assemblymember Chris Ward. Thank you for joining us on The Quest. Thanks, Emily. Good to be with you. So what does Pride Month and its celebrations mean to you? And what do you hope that people will, not just San Diego, but California as a whole, what do you hope that they'll take away from this year's celebrations? And what do you think will educate them this year? Pride Month, I would say, is three sort of key things. One it is remembering our history uh, for all of those that struggled to gain equality and uh, to celebrate how far we've come, how open we can be in mm-hmm. California, and uh, to be able to just enjoy each other's company and community. And you see that in celebrations across the state. Uh, the second thing is it's a protest. It always has been. It started with the Stonewall riots in 1969, and we can't forget that element in history. But we continue to use pride as a moment to be able to protest today's injustices and the attacks on our community and on all community members who are um, under the threat of hate and extremism uh, and make sure that those issues are not swept under the rug. And the third thing is that it's important to be able to use this time to be able to regroup as we're faced with hate and extremism, which are otherwise trying to be able to take away our rights, um, to be able to organize our community, uh, be aware of these threats, um, remain vigilant, and not let our rights be taken away from us. Mm. And yeah. so it's an organizing tool. It's a tool of remembrance. Uh, it's a tool of protest. Pride is a lot of things. That was very eloquently put. I appreciate that. Um, do you have a favorite Pride event throughout the state of California? Yes. A uh, couple come to mind. Many come to mind. They all come to mind. But yes, I'm going to be biased. And of course, San Diego, uh, we are the third largest pride parade in the country. And that's wow. often something that mo- most people don't know. We're larger than Los Angeles in attendance. Wow. Uh, we're only beat out by San Francisco and New York. And there's a good reason for that. Um, San Diego made an interesting and smart decision back uh, 25 years ago uh, that we were going to move our pride parade from June to July. Most cities do celebrate their pride month uh, uh, their, their Pride Parade during Pride Month, the month of June. Um, but we realized two things. One, uh, it's generally cloudy in San Diego in June. <laughs> it is sunny and warm and uh, a great tourist experience in July. And when they moved it, because of our weather patterns, they also realized that we were one of the only ones in the country having a, a big weekend ceremony in July. And we actually attracted, you know, I think this year, $11 million of tourism interest uh, for people that wanted to celebrate. They wanted Pride to continue, and San Diego was a great place to go. Um, so it's big. It's festive. It's, again, it's such a tight-knit community. Um, I'd like to highlight, you know, the work that our caucus is doing at the state capitol, and we're celebrating that on June 3rd, uh, recognizing honorees from across the state and all their significant contributions, and then also celebrating with the capital community up here for staff and uh, capital community members uh, to be able to come together and just kick off Pride in a good way. But I have to add as well, sorry, this is a long answer because this is important. We have had a chance to go out there through our rural tour and meet with other um, communities as well. And so you may not think of it, but little pride ceremonies are popping up in small towns across California. And some of them are still having their first pride ceremony. And I've been to some of those and it is meaningful because they're coming out of the shadows. They're still coming out of the closets today and in areas that you think are you know, a little more culturally conservative. It is just meaningful to see community members there who live there, who want to know that they, other for their neighbors to know that they exist, to be able to um, form a, a small 200, 400 person pride gathering and, uh, and be able to celebrate it and not have to travel to West Hollywood or something else to be able to be their authentic selves. That is amazing that mm-hmm. across California, we're still seeing some of the first pride parade marches happening. And so, um, you know, we, we certainly encourage that. So you've been working in public service for quite some time. Uh, Prior to your time here in the legislature, you were an urban planner and a city council member in San Diego. Um, How are the issues you saw in San Diego similar to what you're working on here in California for the state? 
Yeah, no, thank you. It's been a long road. And even before that was uh, chief of staff up here at the legislature. So I've seen time elapse. Uh, you've gotten the evolution of issues that, um, you know, we continue to try to progress on. Uh, we witness that there is some regression or uh, forces that are trying to really recede on some of those, pro some of that progress. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, uh, the time that we had locally Yes, with LGBT issues, but on housing or other things that I care about, you know, is just a sort of either pilot case or a snapshot of the issues that we are experiencing statewide. Um, but it is an urban environment. And so there are other things to be thoughtful of as there are corners of California that don't have access to representatives or community-based resources like we enjoy in West Hollywood, San Francisco, or Hillcrest. And so it's important for us to know it's a caucus initiative this year to get out to rural communities and listen deeply and, and, and be mindful as we're working on statewide support or policy about everybody's perspectives as we try to finalize legislation. Yeah, of course. Um, have solutions that you used in San Diego, you know, kind of helped on a statewide level? What's, is there any standouts that you remember or, you know, can pinpoint in this moment? Yeah, I talk often, some of our housing work that I did when I was on city council, where I was also the chair of our land use and housing committee and chair of our continuum of care that governs a lot of our, and directs a lot of our um, homelessness services uh, decisions, um, have shown positive impact, have had good outcomes. And so when that's working, we want to try to emulate that for statewide policy for everybody's benefit. And so on density bonus questions, on um, best practices that we have around some of our homelessness programs, those are things that we're trying to take my own experience, but importantly, the community lessons from San Diego and infuse uh, into a better direction for California policy. Um. What are some key issues that the LGBTQ caucus is focusing on this year? Is there an overarching theme? Um, is, what? How would you describe the priority list this year? The priority list is actually pretty broad. And, you know, we've got 12 members. We're very proud of our caucus. We are 10 percent of the legislature, which is the first in the country to wow. achieve 10 percent parity, um, which we, you know, hold from general public surveys is kind of reflective of the general population. So that's exciting. Um, we might grow next year after the elections uh, to, to an even 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 larger number. Um, but with all those members, we're able to tackle a lot of issues that, that remain of high importance to our community. Foremost, we just introduced uh, this past month the Safety Act, and that's uh, really trying to get at some of these forced outing policies that we're seeing pop up across the state in uh, some school districts that are really harming um, the well-being and, um, and, and support uh, networks that we need for uh, youth. And um, so that's something that we were able to introduce. It is actively going through the legislative process. We began with the Senate education uh, last month on May 29th, and uh, that received uh, passage out of that committee. And so from the time of this taping, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through more steps. It's important to recognize that in the past year that we've had these forced outing policies just uh, really developed at the local district level that we can witness. You know, we believed at the time that they were not okay and they'd be harmful. Um, we were tackling this uh, with the support of the attorney general and the superintendent of public instruction in the courts. Uh, we witnessed the impact and, and, and it wasn't good. Um, it, in fact, it did the opposite of what the proponents said that it would do. Uh, it really kicked up a dust storm of chaos and uh, hate and uh, bullying uh, at many of these campuses, and not just at LGBTQ students, but their friends and the general school community and, and, and campus culture that, you know, we were fearful would happen. It has been happening. And so it's time that we step in and pass the Safety Act to create a real strong and clear baseline for all school districts that we want to make sure that the teachers are not the gender police, that students have the ability to have access to support and services that can redirect them as they're evaluating their own individual and personal questions, and that teachers can just get back to teaching. Um, with AB 1955, the Safety Act, yes, um, we know that you did recently have a um, news conference on this where you did feature testimony from a young uh, person named Kai. We have the, his testimony here that we'd like to play for you. Having a trusted adult is paramount to ensuring a queer kid makes it to their next birthday. Mm. Without my teacher, I would not be here today. Please don't let another kid endure the heartbreaking consequences of that support system being taken away. If you care about kids, you'll enact this legislation that will protect their well-being and protect their lives. 
what was it like knowing that you're able to help somebody like Kai with this legislation? How does that how does that sit with you? Well, his example and his words, and I have to really highlight that he was incredibly brave to come to the press conference and mm-hmm. you know speak about his own personal experience because it is sadly the experience of many youth um, who are transgender and who are navigating a very difficult and sometimes repressive environment. And uh, that could, you know, take the form of uh, bullying and harassment at, at, the, at the schools. It could take the form of rejection in some homes. Um, but we're trying to get everybody towards a place of understanding and acceptance and ultimately the safety and well-being for kids like Kai. Um, and so being so honest about that experiences underscores and helps us remember that there are a lot of people like Kai who did take their own life or whose situation did not work out well like his fortunately did. Um, But he had to remind us all that it did take somebody in his immediate environment to be able to help to kind of navigate the experiences that he was feeling at the time so that he could get to, into a place that that, that he is uh, able uh, to enjoy today. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's helpful to have these brave personal testimonies because it personalizes what sometimes we're talking about. You know, it's helpful for him to be able to have testimony and be able to share a story because it personalizes and puts a, a face and a name and a real world experience on something that can be very vague and undefined as we're looking at the state code and what does that mean these these are real lives these are real individuals and there's more like that out there who can benefit from the same protections you know kai was able to navigate something in a space that fortunately around his immediate and and personal environment worked out well for him but we're seeing if kai was in a situation that was in a district that had these forced outing policies it may not have gone well for him and he said that he may not be with us today and that should sink very strongly with anybody who cares about the lives of our youth, Mm -hmm. about whether, you know, regardless of your preconceived ideas around this issue, um, that you would not want youth to be in a place uh, where they're going to be harming themselves or set back. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to ask, why now for this legislation? Well, you know, let's be clear. We did not start this conversation. It was, again, one of these extreme and regressive forces that was thrust upon California schools just last summer. Um, It was offensive, and we thought critically at the time about how to respond, because our ultimate goal as a caucus is to make sure that we are standing up for community members' issues and offering them the protections of state support and legislation to be able to have a bright and 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 positive future ahead of them um but you know things will come at us and we do need to respond so why now uh as i had mentioned before we had thought about the time wanting to be able to tackle this issue last summer we recognized that potentially there were other ways to be able to work through some of these questions court action can sometimes resolve things quicker than we can when it takes a a better part of a year to be able to pass a bill into law um the state superintendent public construction also had strong leadership and wanted to tackle some of these issues and we wanted to evaluate how things were going so we had more california data to really underscore what we thought at the time would, would be a theory but it's no longer a theory it's reality And so armed with all of that, we have a lot more to be able to convince our legislative colleagues that this is the right line in the sand to draw and to be supportive of uh, the Safety Act. Are there any other standout bills that the rest of the members on the caucus have introduced this year? Um, I wanted to expand a little bit on, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe some of the other caucus members, because, again, we're so strong and and, and we've got a lot of great contribution. Um, You know, the, the, the general expanse we have and in, in issues of, you know, health care, uh, being able to protect access to some of the preventative services, still trying to make sure um, that we've got support for PrEP, including HIV and other STI screening, uh, that we've got, ex- you know, we're trying to expedite medical licensure for gender-affirming care with uh, one of Assemblymember Zabur's bills um, because the need is so great out there and and, and, the re- and the those that are qualified or understand the issues are so disproportionately not available compared to the broader 
medical community. We want to make sure that that's uh, something that's uh, given a little bit of a prioritize, prioritization um, on uh, issues of foster care because of the disproportionate effect um, that we have with LGBTQ youth who are in the foster care system, um, making sure that infertility or fertility treatment uh, is prioritized. It's a severe disadvantage for members of the community that are willing or interested in seeking fertility care to be able to start a family. And Senator Menjavar has been a champion in that space. Uh, SOGI data collection, you can't know your progress or you can't actually have informed information if you're not understanding across a lot of state agencies how their programs are connected to or are advantaging or disadvantaging LGBTQ community members uh, without, if you're not capturing sexual orientation or gender identity information. Um, working uh, on higher education equity, Senator Eggman is going out strong on this and other issues. So we just have a real breadth of issues because our community's issues, I think, are so broad um, that in this month of pride, um, we are really happy to lift up and, uh, you know, try to get through the second house policy committees uh, and ultimately be able to celebrate when the governor signs these bills. Um, I know another one of your um, pieces of legislation this year is AB 1979, mm -hmm. the Doxing Victims Resource Act. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and maybe not just in terms of the LGBTQ community, but I know that this can definitely help so many. Sure. Again, as hate actors are targeting individual Californians that are out there, obviously sometimes they use doxing as a form of harassment um, and a threat of harm. And, and sometimes that threat becomes real and, and an individual actually is harmed. Now, doxing is already defined and is a crime under the penal code. Um, but there is no recourse in the civil code for a victim to be able to help them possibly regain support and be able to use that to the, towards the betterment of their lives for, for the harms that they endured. Um, so that's what AB 1979 will allow is really the civil side of that, that, that criminal code. So victims would be able to pursue an action and receive restitution for some of those harms, and that would be able to go to support them getting their lives back on track. Um, it's important that they have these protections in place, and it's not about them making money, and it, it goes beyond even them being able to make themselves whole. It's hopefully another way that we can send a signal of deterrence from the actions happening in the first place, that there are serious consequences and we try to make sure that our state laws, the penalties are commiserate with the harms that um, they decided to, to inflict. You are chair of the housing committee here in the assembly. Um, homelessness and affordable housing are serious issues with many communities, including the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. um, is there housing legislation this year that would particularly help those communities or just anything, initiative, budget ask, things like that? Really, uh, first of all, the LGBT community does have some challenges within it um, for individuals that are at risk of homelessness um, for a lot of social reasons, people who have been left behind in uh time points in their in their lives that are um, really placing them at, you know, more disadvantaged situations with income and challenging them to be able to stably uh, remain housed. Um, and we see uh, those that are transgender uh, have a dis are disproportionately higher uh, of a population for, for those who are on the streets, for example. And again, traces back to a lot of the same social reasons. So generally, a lot of the advocacy that we're trying to do to prioritize housing and homelessness support is going to proportionally be able to support those that are most in need. Um, and that includes members of the LGBT community. LGBT seniors are also at very strong risk because especially for those that came before me, um, mm. those that are uh, in their 60s or 70s, you know, had come out at a time when it was a lot more isolating and a lot more difficult to be open. Right. Um, but when they did come out, you know, they were much more likely to be ostracized by family. So there's not as great of a support network for them from family members to care for them or take them in. And so as they are coming into golden years mm -hmm. and they might need assisted living or they might need somebody to help care for daily living, they're more reliant on social services to be able to maintain a great quality of life. Um, as we celebrate Pride Month, are you proud of what California has done for the LGBTQ community? I am. I love being a Californian. I made that choice uh, when I was a young adult uh, to 
when I came here, it felt right. I wanted to make my home here and I wanted to give back to community and, and make it even better and see the advances that we've enjoyed in, in the last 25 years. Um, and I'm proud of our straight allies and, and those who stand with us where they used to be difficult votes um, 20 years ago. And people have really come on board almost almost uniformly within our Democratic caucus um, to be standing with us uh, in the face of some of this hate or, or regressive uh, proposals that are out there. Um, so I'm very proud of where we come, but I'm mindful that our rights can be taken away at any given time, um, whether it's through court action that might work its way all the way up to the highest level of this court. Um, that's why we had introduced ACA 5, which will be on the November ballot, and we'll uh, make sure that we are taking Prop 8 language, which is inactive right now, thanks to the Obergefell decision. That will be taken out of our state constitution. And that was definitely one of the low points, I think, being a Californian, that for all I felt that we had come as far as we did in the year 2008, that people had voted to not extend marriage equality to us and deny us that. Um, we had that eight-month window where people were able to get married and they stripped away a right. Um, fast forward, you know, another 16 years since 2008 and the public opinion and mood because somebody knows somebody else that has gotten married, their neighbors, they are happier, they are able to have a more total and equal family dynamic. Um, and it's just not that big of a deal for most Californians. There are some haters out there, um, but it would be so meaningful if the vote was not even close, if we were able to show 70 percent or even more uh, of support for repealing that hateful language out of our state constitution. So if something happens nationally, I hope it doesn't, um, but out of our control through court action, that at least Californians are protected with their right uh, to marriage equality. Lastly, can the country still look west to California for leadership on LGBTQ uh, initiatives and rights? Yes, the country should look west. We have a lot of, you know, um, you know, well-meaning and 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 forward-thinking uh, legislation. Uh, the two that I just mentioned there, uh, we would be the first in the country that. Uh, let me say it this way: there are we're aware eleven or twelve states which have enacted policies to require or encourage forced outings. Um, they're in states that would probably be predictable. Um, but they are harming members of the community over there. We would be the first state in the country that actually would prohibit these policies because we know the damage that they can do and we know that there's a better way forward. And so we would hope that this sets a trend for other states to look to California uh, to be able to emulate there and, and protect youth nationwide. We want to thank Assemblymember Ward for being on this episode of Look West. I'm Emily Weber. Thank you for listening. The Look West podcast is produced for the Assembly Democratic Caucus by the DCO Pod Squad. Please like, share, and subscribe to hear all the Look West episodes. A new episode of the Look West podcast drops on the third Thursday of every month. Thanks again for listening, and remember, when you think of California and politics, remember to look west.